we're so glad you've come this morning. And again, as always, we believe that God has a word for someone today. And we hope that today when you leave, you will have heard from the Lord. How many of you believe that this is a time where we need to see a spiritual renewal and an awaking again, something that will come from heaven and someone, the Holy Spirit, to move among the churches again, once again to bring His love, His light, His cleansing, and His renewing power into our hearts. I think we're living in a day and a time where the answer that we're looking for is only going to be found in God. And I believe today that as we look at the life of Elijah, we're seeing a similar time and a time when God demonstrated His power in a mighty way. And I'm praying, God, do it again, do it again, do it again. Today we're looking at the Mount Carmel sh uh, showdown. I, you've heard of the thrilla in Manila. You've heard of the rumble in the jungle. Well, this is the throwdown on the mountain. And uh, it's going to be a winner take all. This is not going to end well for the losers. Uh, the losers are going to, uh, this is going to be their last day on earth. So you had better win because if you don't win, you lose badly. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of 1 Kings, and let's go to chapter 18. Chapter 18. Let's begin reading. Uh, oh, let's start reading at verse 17. Verse 17. In 1 Kings 8, 17, I'm going to read a little bit of a lengthy passage because this is so Important. This is one of those great, exciting moments in the Old Testament. You know, when you think of certain characters in the Bible, you think of Noah, you think of the flood, you think of Abraham, you think of Isaac, you think of Joshua, you think of Jericho, you think of David, you think of Goliath. And when we come to Daniel, we think of the lion's den, we think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we think of the fiery furnace, we think of Elijah, and we think of the confrontation on the mountain of Mount Carmel. Verse 17 says, And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? Now that word troubler, it's an interesting word in the Hebrew. It has several connotations. One of the connotations is snake. You might just be thinking that Ahab looked at Elijah. He'd been looking for him now for about three, three and a half years because of the great drought. Israel was now uh, experiencing a crisis because there had been no rain. The crops were drying up and the livestock was uh, dying. And so Elijah when he finally does show himself to the king who had been looking for him all this time, when the king sees him, he says, you snake. So it gives you some kind of an idea of how King Ahab felt about Elijah. There was absolutely no love lost between these two. The king blamed Elijah for everything. And Elijah retorts back, hey, I'm not the snake here you are. He said, um, you and your father's house, because you have abandoned, not ignored, but abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. You see, back in Deuteronomy, God said that if you go into idolatry, you turn your back on me and I will shut up the heavens. That's what God had said to Israel. That there were consequences. There were blessings, but there were also the negative consequences of going your own way, doing your own thing, and turning your back on the God who loved them, the God who chose them, the God who had blessed them, the God who would make of them a great nation. But turning their back would mean that they would suffer those consequences. And God always starts off small, and He kind of builds up and ramps up 
the difficulties because he is praying and hoping he's saying, come back to me, call upon me. If you will call upon me, I will hear, I will answer, I will heal your land. So that's what we find ourselves in now. The northern ten tribes have just rebelled against God. They have each one gone into this Baal worship, and a lot of them probably had this mixture, an eclectic religion. A little Jehovah, a little Baal. You know, just whatever. Uh, after all, one is not necessarily more important than the other. Today's philosophy is it's not important what your religion is. It's just important that you are sincere and you really believe what you believe. Well, we're going to see that what you believe does make a difference. And so he says it's because of you. And then verse 19, Elijah sets up the contest. This is going to be a major, major contest. And so this is when you need to confront the world. And Elijah is setting up. Now, be sure that you know this. Because when you get over later on and you see what God says, God says through Elijah, everything that Elijah does is because God has directed him to. Elijah doesn't come up with this contest on his own. He is only doing this because God said, this is how I want it to be done. And so, he said, I want you to gather all of Israel to Mount Carmel. And the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400, and, uh, the 400 prophets of Asherah. Asherah was considered the consort of Baal. Just to kind of give you a little bit of a background, Baal religion was, it was a very profane religion. There was sacrifices giving, sometimes child sacrifices. There was a lot of sexual immorality associated with the so-called fertility rites and all the things that were debasing and immoral. And, uh, and so Asher was considered the consort of Baal. And he says, these 850 people, prophets, they all sit at Jezebel's table. So Jezebel was the patron for these false prophets. And they ate at her table. So obviously, they enjoyed a good life more than the average people. And as such, they wanted to keep this system going. You see, Elijah didn't come along wanting to show that God was greater. Yes, that was part of it. Elijah wanted to destroy idolatry in the nation. He wanted a fatal swoop. He wanted to just annihilate idolatry. And so he says, let's all meet on Mount Carmel. Now, why Mount Carmel? Well, Mount Carmel is one of the highest points in Israel. And when you're up there, and we have some pictures that I should have shown you. I should have brought those. But anyway, on Mount Carmel, you can look out and see over the sea. You can look out over the valley. It is a high point. And one of the things that God had on Mount Carmel was a major altar. And that was an altar to his name. And it was a place where sacrifices uh, were often given. The people knew from a geopolitical point of view, whoever owned the high ground militarily would pretty well control all of northern Israel. They also knew, too, whoever controlled Mount Carmel spiritually would control the spiritual life of the nation. And so they had torn down God's altar up there. And they had erected altars to Baal. So obviously there was a, a real reason why Mount Carmel was important to Elijah. And he wanted to go up there, bring all the people up there, bring all the prophets, the 850 prophets up there. Ahab, you come too. And we will determine once and for all who is God. And so... For some reason, Ahab agrees to it. So Ahab now is following the orders of Elijah. And you'll notice Jezebel wasn't there because she's what? She's not going to listen to this guy. 
Verse 20, so Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? How long will you hop from one to the other, to the other, to the other? If it's God, if He is the Lord, if the Lord is God, follow Him. If Baal is God, then you follow Him. And the people did not answer a word. This is interesting. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am the left of the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now, it's not really true that he was the only prophet of the Lord left in the land. There was a prophet in the Lord that you find in the first part of this chapter. His name was Obadiah. And he had been taking care of a 50 prophets in one cave, 50 prophets in another cave. So Elijah wasn't the only prophet he may have felt like he was the only prophet because later on we're going to see that Elijah felt like that no one was following the Lord and all Israel but him. He had gotten so down that he couldn't think straight. And we're going to see why depression can do that to you in a later sermon. <clears throat> and so in verse 23, he said, here's the contest. Let two bulls, oxen, be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire... He is God. He is God. And all the people said, okay, that sounds good. Well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for your, your own bull. Prepare it. You go first. For you are many, and you call upon the name of your God, but put no fire on the altar. And so they took the bull that was given them, they prepared it, called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered, and they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing or he is relieving himself, and that's a sanitary way of saying it. Or, <laughs> I read this in Latin, and I also read it in another translation, and it is about as crude as you can get. You're dealing with a mountain man here, okay? He's not, he's not one of the nice, well-dressed, you know, highly... Uh, educated men, but he is highly spiritual. He is very close to Have you ever thought about this? When Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and it was time for him to face crucifixion, who did he meet with up there? There were two. Who were the two? Moses. Who was the other one? Elijah. Evidently, Elijah's crudeness, roughness, didn't bother the Lord. As a matter of fact, when he was facing something tough, he wanted a tough guy to talk to on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Elijah was such a man. And so <clears throat> he kind of taunts them. He throws a lot of sarcasm their way. And he said, maybe he's on a journey or perhaps Baal is asleep and you guys need to get a little louder so you can wake him up. And they did. They crowd louder and cut themselves after the custom with swords and lances until blood was gushing out upon them. And as the midday passed, in other words, afternoon, and they raved on and on, carried on, made a lot of racket and noise, hoot and holler, danced around. 
you know, after a while the people watching this, don't you imagine them watching their so-called prophets and priests? They were looking at them and they were thinking, man, you guys been at this all day. Nothing's happening. After a while, they probably lost interest in it. After a while, they thought, these guys are really looking silly at this point. And I think they began to rethink their position about Baal. And so, verse 29, as midday passed, and they raved on until the time of the evening offering. Now, Israel had pretty well forgotten about the evening offering. They didn't do that. But Elijah knew exactly when the evening offering was being made down in Jerusalem. This would be around the ninth hour or what we would call somewhere around three o'clock. And it says that as midday passed and they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. I mean, you're talking about looking really silly. Notice the three no's. Just circle those three no's there in that verse. But there was no voice. Baal hadn't said a word. No one answered. Baal wasn't home. No one paid attention. This is the worst part because now the people are probably milling around, eating sandwiches, talking to each other, and they pretty well tuned out these heathen over here acting fools. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, Everybody, gather around. Come around. And the people kind of started moving a little closer. He said, I got something to tell you. So the people came there, and he said, now watch me. He began to pick up the big stones that had been torn down. The stones that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. It was a memorial. It had been torn down, and he began to stack them one at a time. Talk about an object lesson. He was saying, we are the people of God. We need to be together. We need to be united. We need to be of one mind, one heart, one purpose. And they were watching him put the stones back together at a time when the nation was so divided politically and spiritually. And so he put them together, one for each of the twelve tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel will be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two selahs of seed, two big bags of seed. And he put the wood in order, and he cut the bull in pieces and laid it. And he said, bring four jars. These are big jars, okay? He said, bring four jars filled with water and pour it on top of the altar. And they did. The water ran down, ran through the altar, ran on the ground. He said, do it again. So a second time, four more jars of water. Water's going everywhere. He said, that's enough. Third time. And so there were a total of 12 jars of water poured down, down the altar and was filling up the trench underneath the altar. He wanted people to know there was no trickery involved. There was no sleight of hand. There was, this was no problem for God. You see, he had really given the prophets of Baal the first opportunity. He let them go first in this contest. It was 850 to 1, really. 850 to 1, they go first, and he gave them so much more time. He let them even pick the bull. He let them whatever they wanted to do except they couldn't use water. So he did this three times, and the water ran and filled the trench. Verse 36 says, And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Now notice Elijah's prayer. It's not a big prayer. You can read it in less than, you can read it in a few seconds. 
He said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. What was he doing? He was saying that the God of Israel is the true God. He says now, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. He was wanting to be authenticated in the eyes of Israel. Why? Because his message had been one of repentance. And he wanted to be authenticated by God because he wanted his message to be authenticated. And that he was really sent by God and he was doing God's business and they needed to listen to him because he was speaking for God. Elijah was not making this stuff up. And so he prayed that simple prayer that you are God in Israel, I'm your servant, and I've done all these things at your word. You need to underline that phrase, at your word. Elijah did not do this on his own. He didn't sit around and think, now how can we figure out a way to make the people of Israel repent and come back? He didn't. God gave the plan to him. Listen, if God has spoken, he will stand by his word. If he's made a promise, you can count on it. He will keep his promise. He is trustworthy. You can lay your soul at the feet of those promises knowing that eternity that looms before us all is already taken care of for us. And so... He prays that short prayer. He asked God to vindicate. He wanted their hearts to be turned back. Verse 37, Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. This is what God's plan was, not to punish them, but to turn their hearts back to him. Sometimes difficulty comes in our life not as God's punishment, but it's God's way of trying to get our attention and draw us back to himself so he can pour out blessings. Verse 38, man, this is the, this is the verse of power. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When it was all over, there was nothing but a clean, bare spot where that altar had been. I mean, it was one thing to have the sacrifice gone, but the sacrifice, the wood, even the stones, can you imagine how hot that fire must have been? You see, Baal was the god of weather. Surely he could muster up at least one lightning bolt to hit the sacrifice of the prophets of Baal, but he he didn't answer. He was also the God who would send rain. You see, I'm sure Ahab probably thought that because of Elijah, Baal got mad at Israel, and Baal was the one refusing to send rain. And that if they only got rid of Elijah, everything would be okay. If we kill Elijah, the rain will come back because Baal will be satisfied. Isn't it amazing how that people can come up with reasons for everything? And of course today, if God should send drought again, what would people say? It would not be something oh, God is trying to get our attention, it would be, well, we've got man-made climate change is going on. Nothing to do with God, all to do with man. And so the fire fell. Now, can you imagine being there on that mount? I'm sure Elijah said, okay, everybody, stand back, stand back. Don't get too close. It's going to really get hot here in a moment. Just stand back. He prays this prayer, short prayer, and in that moment there is a fire 
that falls. Now, fire naturally starts low and heat rises up. But this fire came from up and it came down. Telling me this is not a natural fire. This is not an earthly fire. This is a Holy Spirit fire. Our God is a consuming what? Fire, the Bible says. And that fire came and consumed that entire altar. Consumed it. Every bit of it. And all the people fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Well, wouldn't it be nice to think that what they did here was something that would last a long time. But you see, the people, this was not anything but a momentary persuasion. This was not a lasting revival in Israel. The people were decidedly persuaded, but they were not lastingly changed. Can I, can I say that again? The people saw this, and they said, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. You think, wow, revival's going to break out. No, it didn't. Did you know from the time the nation divided, there was never, never, ever, from the time until they were carried off captive, there was never revival in Israel. There was never a good, righteous king in Israel. That says a lot. You see, they were decidedly persuaded. Oh, yeah, yeah, God, God, He's God. God is God. God is God. Yeah, He's God. But while they were decidedly persuaded, they were not lastingly changed. I think sometimes that happens to people. They come to church, hear a sermon, God convicts them. Yeah, God's God, God's God. And then they go away, and it's not long before they're right back like they were. Well, what happened? Well, the people, a person can be decidedly persuaded, but not lastingly changed on the inside. You see, the Bible says when you really commit and turn your life totally over to the Lord, Realizing that He died on the cross for your sins, that He was buried, He rose again for your justification, that He is the only way to eternal life. And when you embrace that wholeheartedly, Paul said you're a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, how much has become new? All things. And if all things didn't become new, maybe you got persuaded, but you were not everlastingly changed. That doesn't mean that you lived a perfect life, but it does mean what? It does mean there has to be an inward transformation in order for there to be lasting salvation. Otherwise, all we have is a persuasion that does not produce a new birth. And so this was at the time of the evening sacrifice. God showed up. God answered a short prayer. God said, there are some things I want you to see. And he showed himself that day strong and mighty. Now, let me give you a few things that I think are important in this conflict. I want to give you four thoughts real quick as we kind of begin to wrap this story up. Write these four things down because I think they're going to be really important to you. Number one, all religions are not the same. Did the prophets of Baal have enthusiasm? Yep. Did they have a lot of excitement and put on a great show? Yeah, for a while. Did they make a lot of noise? Yes. Were they loud? Obviously. Did they believe their religion? 
Well, they must have because they were cutting themselves, spilling their own blood because they figured, well, Baal didn't accept the blood of the bull. Maybe he'll accept our blood. All religions are not the same. We hear that today a lot. We hear that it does not matter what you believe so long as you believe. You see, Elijah was showing that what you believe does make a difference. They believed in Baal, but Baal did not show up. Because Baal is nothing. Baal is a demon that God had put the clamps to. And he couldn't say a word. He couldn't do a thing. Some people are just so caught up into this business that it's they're all the same. And what does Elijah do? He used sarcasm. He made fun of them. Elijah is not in the woke crowd. He's not politically correct. He was making fun of somebody else's religion. You do that today, and you get canceled. You're the one who's the bad guy. The moment you say Jesus Christ is the only way, He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father except He come through me, Jesus said. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Is it true? If Jesus is God, does He not deserve to be worshipped as God? If all of this other stuff is equally God then it doesn't matter. But if Jesus is the unique, decidedly Son of the living God, then He deserves all our worship, not a divided worship. And that's what's happening. We've got a little Christianity, a little New Age, a little Eastern mysticism, a little cultism. We just kind of put it all in the religious pot and stir it up. This old, rough, rugged mountain man was not going to play nice with the prophets of idolatry. He wasn't going to be, oh, diplomatic. You can say a lot of things about Elijah, but diplomacy was not his strong suit. So all religions are not the same. They are not. And people who tell you that have their own personal agendas. They have their own personal lifestyles. And for them, they have to believe that because to believe that God is means I have to answer to Him and I do not want to answer to any God. So I'll make up a few and I'll design a God after my own desires and I'll answer to that God and, me, and that God and I get along great. Because he never condemns. He never judges. He never says this is wrong. He never uses the word sin. So that's my God. So that's number one. Elijah on Mount Carmel proved that not all religions are the same, folks. You need to get a hold of that. Number two. Activity and enthusiasm are not always a sign of true spirituality. Now, I've heard people say, I was, you know, talk to them, they say, well, I'm spiritual. What does that mean? I'm spiritual. You know, you can be spiritual and pray to a rock. I'm spiritual. Well, I'm a light bulb. So what? You see, you can identify yourself as anything you want to anymore, can't you? So I'm going to identify as a light bulb. I'm bright. Wherever I go, I'm bright. So people identify, I'm spiritual. What does that mean? It doesn't mean a thing. It does not mean a thing. 
Activity and enthusiasm. These guys, these 850, they were all spiritual. They were all enthusiastic in their beliefs. They were all making a lot of racket and noise. And sometimes, just because you go into a church and there's a lot of racket and noise doesn't necessarily mean the Holy Spirit is producing it. Now, I do believe that when the Holy Spirit's moving, you know it. And people respond and react differently. Some people weep, some people laugh, some people stand up, some people put their hands in the air. It's fine. But just don't confuse certain actions with true spirituality. God says, I look for those who worship me in spirit and in what? Ah, in truth. Worship me in the power of the Holy Spirit and in truth. If the Word of God doesn't support it, then it is not true. Number three. Number three. The act of faith is not the most important thing. It's the object of your faith. Did these 850 have faith? Well, they showed up, didn't they? Of course, Ahab told them they had to, but still, they showed up. They went through all of their rituals. They went through all of their hocus-pocus stuff. They did all of that and I'm sure some of them were doing it in faith. Really believed that Baal was the god of who he, of the sun. <laughs> and I think it's interesting. You know, Baal is the, is the sun god in charge of the weather and all that kind of stuff. As the sun is setting, as Baal is going away, they get louder. <laughs> Don't leave. So the act of faith, their act of faith in Baal... We don't question their act of faith because the act of faith is not the most important thing. It's not the most important thing. Well, I got faith. I got faith. No, you got faith in faith. Your faith is only as good as the object upon which it rests. If your faith isn't resting upon the object of God, the creator of the universe, the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, your faith is not any good, as sincere as it may be. I may have faith in you, but you might let me down. So my faith is only as good as the object upon which it rests. Then number four, number four. The faith you live by better be good enough to die by. Is what you're believing, does it bring you comfort in the hour of death? Is what you're believing, does it spring forth eternal hope? Is what you're believing that you say you're living by, is it strong enough to produce after you're dead? There's a lot of people who believe a lot of weird and strange things, but something tells me as they come to the end of life, they're going to have to do a little reassessing. Is what I believe, is it strong enough to carry me all the way? All the way. And some people, I think, on their deathbed begin to kind of wonder. They begin to kind of doubt Now, one of the things that I would like to skip, but I can't, is that after the fire fell, after the people said, the Lord is God, the Lord is God, He is God, the next thing Elijah does is he says, take these 850 down to the stream, down the hill to the stream. And we now have the purge. And Elijah, this rough mountain man, what does he do to these false prophets? 
And this is where a lot of people have a problem. What does he do? He slaughters every one. Now, some people say, well, what kind of a God would require that? Well, you remember that in the book of Exodus, chapter 20 and verse 3, God said, I hate idolatry. Why? Because idolatry sets itself up in the place of God to be worshipped as God. Now, when Lucifer did that, he was kicked out of heaven. And one day he's going to be cast into hell forever and ever. So God says, this is how I feel about idolatry. It has taken my people, called by my name, the people I have chosen, and it has pulled them away from me and sent them off into a religion that is going to condemn them to eternal hell. And that I cannot have. And Elijah knows this because in the Bible, God says those who are caught up in idolatry are worthy of death. He kills them all. And this is again where some people just say, well, I mean, after all, they, they've been proven to be fools. What else do you need to do? You certainly don't need to kill them, do you? Let me just say this. There are always consequences to the choices we make. Always. Whatever choice you make, you're free to make it. But what you're not free to do is to choose the consequences of your choices. Because your choice has a built-in consequence that comes with that choice. And here the choice was, we will serve not Jehovah, but we will serve Baal. Okay, the consequence is there's a day of reckoning. As old Dr. R.G. Lee used to preach, there's a payday someday. And so payday came on Mount Carmel. And so there was the purge. Now, again, we're sitting here thinking, well, great, now we got rid of all this crowd and everything is going to be great again. Israel's going to turn back to God. They're going to destroy that altar at Dan. And they're just going to be uh, going down to Jerusalem to the temple worship. And Ahab and Jezebel is going to be okay with it. You know, that's what we'd like to see happen. But that was not reality. Reality was Ahab made his way back to Jezebel. Now that's Ahab's way of doing things. Anytime he was upset, anytime he got his toe stubbed, anytime things didn't go his way, he went running back to Jezebel, put his head in her lap and cried like a little baby. I don't know, maybe he had his blankie. I don't know, maybe he had some little pacifier. I don't know. Jezebel was always saying, now, there, 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 honey. Don't you worry about a thing. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to take care of it. I mean, he was a pathetic image of a man. Lousy king. He was married to a very narcissistic psychopath. And she hated Elijah. She hated him with, a, and she hated him even more after he cleaned house. So she says, Well, two can play that game. She sends a little message to him and says, Hey, dude, this time tomorrow, you're going to be like my prophets. You're going to be dead. I will hunt you down and I will kill you. She's just a sweet lady, isn't she? How would you like to have her for a neighbor? Ooh. And we're going to see what Elijah's response to that. What you see in 1 Kings 18 of this rugged mountain man, we're going to see another side to him in our next sermon. And you're going to think, what in the world happened to Elijah? How did he go from being a stalwart man of God, looking the devil in the eye and saying, bring it on, to now being 
a guy who's running and hiding, feeling sorry for himself, caught up in the throes of depression. What happened? More importantly, how did God deal with that? Well, we'll talk about that next week because God has some things to say to all of us about this matter of depression and spiritual malaise and defeat. But God was doing great things. Did the rain come? Oh, you better believe it came. Elijah told Ahab, hey, you better get in your chair and get out of here. Rain's coming. Ahab looks up and says, it's all blue skies. All blue skies. Elijah says, I don't care what it looks like. Rain is coming, and I know it's coming, and you're in that big heavy chariot, and if you want to get home, you better leave now, or else you're not going to get through the mud to get home. He says, ah, I guess I better go. He'd have a call far down on me. <laughs> so he gets in his chariot, and he takes off. And the Bible tells us that Elijah gets in a prayer position. Now, his prayer position was different. He got down all the way down to the ground, and he put his head down between his knees. I don't even think I can do that. I'd have to go to the chiropractor. You'd probably have to come pick me up, all of me up, because I don't even think I could stand up after I got in that position. But he was down on his knees, head between his knees, and he began to pray. He began. Now that tells me your position in prayer is not important. Whether you stand, kneel, bow, flat on your face, flat on your back. God is not considering the position of your body. He's considering the position of your heart. And so Elijah is down there praying, and he says to his servant, go up to the top of the hill and see if you see any clouds. Look out toward the sea. Look out toward the west. Servant goes up and says, nope, all blue sky. He keeps praying. He says, Lord, you said you would send rain. He sends him a second time. Servant goes up, looks out over the Mediterranean. Nope. Nothing. Third time, he prays. Go on up. Servant goes up, comes back, and says, I'm sorry, but there's nothing. He does that until the seventh time. Seven is always an important number in God's economy. Now that tells me that Elijah would not give up in prayer. It's kind of interesting, I, when I was reading this, the Bible says that after this contest, and Elijah says to Ahab the king, you need to get out of here, Ahab goes and he eats and drinks. Elijah goes to his knees in prayer. That reveals something about both of those men, doesn't it? One man is really consumed with his flesh and the pleasures of his flesh and whatever his flesh wants, where another man is still concerned about what God wants to do next and goes to his knees, and he does not care what his servant sees. He says, I know what God says, and what God says is more real than what you see. And too often, we as Christians want to go by what we see or what we hear rather than what God has said. Because what God has said will always take precedence over what we see and hear. And as he is on his knees the seventh time, he is literally praying the will of God into fruition. He is laying hold of the promises of God, and he's not going to give up on those promises until it happens. And he's praying and praying and praying. And at the seventh time, he says, go up to the mountain. And his servant runs up one more time, and he, his servant's probably getting a pretty good workout. And uh, he's up there, and he looks, and whoop, 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 what do I see? 
He came back. He said, I don't see much. He says, there's an itty bitty cloud about the size of a man's hand. Elijah said, that's what I've been waiting for. Now, you would say, well, what I've been waiting for is big black clouds. No, Elijah said, that's all I need. That's all I need. Because I know in that small cloud is going to come a big promise. Sometimes we look at things as insignificant and we don't see God working a big thing. And so he tells Ahab, now's the time to get in your chariot. Quit eating. Get in the chariot. Go home to mama. And what's interesting is he takes off in the chariot. And uh, this is, uh, I don't know, what, what do they say, about 14 miles from where they are at Mount Carmel back to Samaria, the camp of the palace. 14 miles. So Ahab is in his chariot, and he's trucking along, heading back to Samaria. The Bible says the power of God came upon Elijah. <laughs> this is amazing to me. Elijah puts his Nikes on, and he starts running. And he is running under the power of God. Now get this. He is running faster than Ahab's chariot. Can you imagine Ahab in his chariot, and he looks over. Well, there's that cotton picking Elijah. Boom. Elijah says, eat my dust. You know, here he goes. He is out running a man in a chariot. That, I don't, you talk about a superhero. 14-mile marathon. He set a record. I, if somebody has a stopwatch on it, I bet you nobody ever has beat that record. And he got there ahead. Why? Elijah wanted to be the first one to tell Jezebel. Mm -mm. Nobody else is going to put this word in her ear but Elijah himself, the man she hates, the very soil he walks on. 14 miles cross-country run. Well, folks, today, I don't know what kind of a experience you're having. I don't know what kind of a battle you're in. I don't know what issues you're faced with. I don't know what spiritual battles are raging around you. And the enemy is trying to convince you that God doesn't love you, doesn't care for you, is not going to answer your prayers, and that you've prayed about that so many times and it still hasn't happened. You just might as well quit and give up. I don't know what the lies the enemy's telling you right now, but I want you to know something. You get a hold of a legitimate promise from God, you stand on it, and you stay on it until you see that little small cloud. Because in that cloud, in that small cloud, is a really big God. A really big God. So it does matter what you believe. It does matter upon whom you've placed your faith. It does matter what faith you have. And if you have no faith, today let me point you to the one who says, I, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. If you've been looking for a place to rest your soul, look no further than the one who died in your place that you could have total and complete forgiveness. How long will you halt between two opinions? Let's pray. Father, as we close today, it's been a good time to be with your people. It's been a great time to study this magnificent, strange person called Elijah. The man when you were facing the crucifixion, Moses came and Elijah came to encourage you, to speak to you. 
And I thank you, Father, for his life. I thank you for what he means to us. But I pray as we, we repeat his words, for those that maybe are caught between two opinions, how long will you stay caught? Choose this day whom you will serve. If God be God, serve him. In Jesus' name.